I have been contemplating the idea of investing in real estate and I started doing research and yes, indeed, I found a lot of great news, a lot of benefits about how much of a great investment real estate can be. However, I did not really find that many bad news and I find it really hard to believe. So I was wondering if you can create an episode that highlights all of the risk that comes with investing in real estate and how I can prepare so that I can handle those risks in a very efficient way. If that's the dilemma that you're facing and you're looking for an answer, well, let me tell you that you came to the right episode because we're gonna cover that today. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode at Novo Rice Invest. If this is your first time tuning into this channel, this is your channel for real estate education. So we're here to talk about the complete opposite of what we normally have been covering in our real estate channel and that's bad news related to real estate, right? So let's just go ahead and jump straight into the board to learn about the possible risk that you might encounter when it comes to investing in real estate and what you can do to mitigate those risks. So let's go straight to the board and highlight number one. What's the number one fear that most real estate investors have when it comes to investing in real estate? That is having a bad tenant, right? Oh, my tenant doesn't wanna pay me any rent, my tenant is always late, my tenant this, my tenant that. What can I do? Well. In order to avoid this, you should have done the homework way before you even place a tenant in your apartment. So what am I talking about? There's a process called the qualification of a tenant. You have to qualify a good tenant. So qualify tenant. And what do I mean by qualifying? So it's just kind of like a job application, so to speak, right? So a person sees your property and uh, they're interested and they have to show you, they have to prove you that they're worthy of living in your place. And what most people typically ask is copies of a W-2, sometimes even bank statements, just to make sure that they have a consistent income. And most importantly, that tenant will go through a credit check, right? Why is a credit is such an important thing. Well, because the credit is pretty much the ticket to everything. It's a ticket for you to get a better job, it's a ticket for you to get better financing, better interest rates, better credit card rates, better many things, right? And if the person doesn't even have the decency to take care of their credit, then guess what? If they're not caring about themselves, what makes you think they're gonna care for your property and what makes you think that this person is going to pay it on time because in order for them to have good credit they have to always pay their bills on time they have to pay their credit cards on time so that's the number one key the number one fear the number one risk that most people fear and this is how you tackle that now let's go to number two on the list and that's damages so a lot of people are afraid, well, if I place this tenant here and it didn't work out well, they might destroy everything I have. They might break down the walls, just like you see in some of those HGTV shows of those ugly houses. Well, once again, everything trickles back up to this item right here, a bad tenant, a good tenant. If you place a good tenant in place, that means you won't have any damages to worry about. Of course, there's the usual wear and tear that you're gonna have to fix up when the tenant moves out, or even when the tenant is there, things go through the normal course in life and things do break when you use them over time over and over again. But that cost is usually very minor. And when it's time for you to do that, you will usually leverage anything in your cash flow or your cash reserves, right? Because typically, if you did your numbers right and if you invested in the right property, then you should have a gain at the end of each month after you've covered all of your expenses. And in the event that something unnatural happened, maybe you're dealing with a massive fire or were a flood or something like that, well, these damages will be covered by the insurance that you purchased for the property, right? Because, hey, you should not be cheating yourself out of 
good insurance, right? And don't try to cheat it out by saying that your house is worth less money because I've heard a lot of people do that. You have a house that is worth 200,000, but then when you file the insurance application, you're lying and you're saying that your insurance costs 50,000 just so you can save yourself a couple of bucks. And guess what happened in the end? If your property catches a fire and you need to cash out on that insurance, they're not gonna pay you $200,000 for the value of the property. They're gonna pay you whatever you put in that application. So try to not cheat yourself out of getting good coverage. So that's the second on the list. Now, moving along with the third one, I am so afraid of vacancy, right? Like, ah, oh, what happens if I buy a property and if it's just sitting there doing nothing, like I'm gonna have to put money out of my pocket every single month, and what if the next month doesn't get rented? What if the following month doesn't get rented? Now I'm paying for two places. I'm paying for the places that I live, and I also have to pay for the mortgage of another place that I don't even live in, right? And Yes, I understand your concern, but you shouldn't be having this issue if you did your proper due diligence when it comes to studying the market, right? Before you even consider going into a neighborhood, before you even consider buying anything, you should understand how the market runs and how the market works. Is there any demand for rentals or do most people prefer to buy in this area? And if there is a demand for rental, what type of rentals are we talking about? Are we talking about um, middle working class uh, families who just need a good house but nothing fancy? Or do I need to provide like the, you know, the top of the line granite countertops and the most beautiful kitchen out there? You should really be asking yourself, hey, what is it that the market needs so I can supply something that there will be a demand for because you are meeting their needs. Now, something to uh, keep in mind and uh, I've had this question before. People were wondering, okay, so what's a good time for the property to be vacant? What's, what's a good timeline? And what does it become bad if it exceeds it, right? So depends on the market, but on average, I will have to say a property will stay vacant roughly about six weeks. Why? Well, when a property becomes vacant or let's assume you just bought it or maybe a tenant moves out, there's still some minor things, minor cosmetic fixes that you need to take care of. So we're talking about maybe repainting the walls back to white, maybe they drill a couple of holes there, although usually on the tenant lease you will know no holes in the wall, please. But hey, from time to time, people like to hang their pictures and it's not the end of the world. It's something that you can just easily cover up with plastic and then just put up another coat of painting and that should take about somewhere between one to two weeks depending on the person that you're working with, um, assuming they have other projects going on in the neighborhood. Then after that, you have another three weeks to put the property in the market and start showing it to people. And yes, you probably will get a ton of offers on day one, but it doesn't mean that whoever candidate shows up on day one, it's gonna be the right candidate. That's right, so the remaining three weeks are usually for you to do the proper due diligence and pick the right tenant. Now, I know a lot of people who are brand new to this, who just bought their recent property, they wanna fly. They said, you know what? I just got this property. I wanna get it off my back. I don't wanna have to worry about the mortgage. But, you know, you have to be picky when it comes to stuff like that. Like, you're placing somebody in your property. That person could make your life easy or it could destroy it by causing a lot of stress. So, I'm sure that three weeks are a good investment of your time for you to take the time, go through all the applications, evaluate what is it that they do and whether they can truly be a type of person that you will want to place in your property so you can live off of those rentals or maybe use that rental to pay off your mortgage and call yourself a nice real estate investor. So that's one of the risks that um, a lot of people consider. Another thing that people tend to be afraid of is the inability to pay rent, right? So inability to pay rent. And once again, this whole thing goes back to this one right here, to number one. Why would a tenant not pay rent? Well, maybe you were too much in a rush, somebody showed up to your door and told you everything you wanted to hear, and you're like, oh, you know what, I like this person, this person thinks like me. Remember, acting is very easy for some people. Now, dealing with them long term, that's another story, right? That's why, once again, it's very important for you to go back here and make sure that you are qualifying them the proper way. If you're wondering how you can qualify them, don't worry. There's an episode that I actually created a couple of months ago, and I'm gonna leave the link right down here below so you can actually check it out and take some notes, and that hopefully will make your life a lot easier when it comes to qualifying a good tenant. Now, I understand that that's under 
regular circumstances. We are currently going through unprecedented times. We are currently in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, there are a lot of people who cannot afford to pay the rent, even people who were qualified before, who had really nice jobs, and unfortunately they are unable to do that. Well, for that, under those circumstances, that's when you have to stay informed. With everything that's happening in the market, you can tap into any type of government assistance, whether it's for you or for the tenant, and I actually created a couple of episodes that talked about that subject under CARES Act, right down here at this episode. If you're interested about learning about those type of assistance, you are more than welcome to just check it out. The links are gonna be right down here, but those are, once again, unprecedented times. Under regular circumstances, usually this risk right here that you see, the inability to pay rent, it's usually taken care of if you do qualify a good tenant for yourself. Now, moving along the list, the next item that a lot of people seem to fear a lot, volatility. Now, you might be wondering, what is that? Isn't that what happens in the stock market? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. That's what I'm referring to, the ups and downs, ups and downs. The only difference is that with real estate, the ups and downs happen a little slower, unlike with the stock market, where you always seem to see the charts taking a nosedive and everything going downhill. So real estate is actually not immune to volatility, but you have control over that. How do you control that? Well, the first thing you need to do is to study the market, right? Study market before you even invest in it. And the second it's monitoring it. So what is a good example to show that these two complement one another, that one or the other, they're not mutually exclusive. So let's say for example, you invest in an area and you know it is an up and coming neighborhood. It's leaving its bad past behind. You know it has a lot of potential and you wanna be one of the early adopters. You wanna be one of the earlier investors who goes into the area because you're actually getting a good deal out of it. All you gotta do is just to, you know, hope for the best and see if the city or the local community has any plans of enhancing or revitalizing the local economy. So when you do the study, you know that there's a potential for growth. And typically when you invest in real estate, most of us have an exit strategy. Most of us have a plan, a three-year plan and a five-year plan. If this happens in three years, do I get out or do I stay? If I'm able to achieve this within three years, that means, oh, this is good. Maybe I'll stay another two years or maybe, no, you know what? I'm gonna sell this property, take that money and buy something bigger. You always have to have a plan. You always have to have an exit strategy. And that leads me to monitoring because if you do have an exit strategy, you have to keep monitoring the market constantly. By constantly, I'm not talking about every single day, every minute, every hour, but you do check on the news, the local news, see what's going on. Uh, does it meet the expectations that you had forecast that you have anticipated based on your market study? And all of this, it's going to give you that a forecasting vision that is going to allow you to decide, hey, can I handle this volatility? Can I not handle it? If it's too much and you don't have the stomach for it, then fine, just move on. But if you do, it is within your control because you do have an exit strategy for it, right? Now, I just realized that I ran out of space. So while I clean up the board, why don't you hit the like button right here so you can help this episode rant and help other people like you who are looking for information of this kind. And if you know somebody who could benefit from this type of information, feel free to share the love and share the episode with them right now. We have a clean board now and let's move on to our list. And the next risk that most people tend to fear is getting a lawsuit. And yes, unfortunately, we live in a country, we live in a land of lawsuits where everybody suits everybody, parents, sisters, mother, fathers, anything, you name it, right? Anybody wants to sue everybody because it's the easiest way to get rich. First is the lottery, second through a lawsuit, right? So there are multiple ways to protect yourself against lawsuit. One is proper maintenance, right? So we have maintenance. And then the other one is through insurance, of course. And then the one is by placing your property in a legal entity that's gonna give you that shell, that's gonna protect your assets and yada yada, right? So what are we talking about maintenance? Assuming you did the proper due diligence and you placed the right tenant, because let me just tell you something, a tenant is not the only person who can sue you. Anybody who's walking around, passing by your property can't sue you because accidents can happen Anybody can sue anybody, right? So assuming that you have done the due diligence, you qualified a great tenant, you also have to make sure that you do the proper maintenance. By that I'm talking about, hey, if you live in a state where there's a lot of snow, 
you have to make sure the driveways and like the stairs or or the common areas are taking care of the snow because next thing you know you don't want somebody falling in front of your house and then getting a lawsuit and that applies for pretty much everything else no blockage around common areas we're talking about garbages and stuff like that so make sure everything is clean make sure everything is well maintained uh, make sure nothing looks like it's vacant so that people are not breaking into your properties it's all about the proper maintenance and because we understand that accidents can happen, that's when the insurance comes in place. Let's say somebody was, you know, being as careful as possible, but then unfortunately uh, they slipped in front of your house. Maybe you were shoveling the snow or maybe your property manager was, and then all it took was like a split a second for them to go in to drink some nice hot chocolate. And then by the time they came out, somebody has already fallen in front of the house. So that's why you have insurance to protect yourself. And of course, there's no secret that having an extra layer of an LOC, it's gonna give you the maximum protection as possible. And it can also give you the advantages of tax deduction. And if you have no clue what I'm talking about regarding LOCs, don't worry there's an episode down here that's going to help you complement everything i'm talking about today so feel free to check it out after i'm done with this video now going back to the board and on to the last one and actually my very favorite one and the one that most people don't seem to think about and that is investing in the wrong property and by that, I'm not saying, oh, did you mean to buy the blue house and you ended up buying the red house? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who buy with their emotions, people who come in and they say, oh, but look at this beautiful kitchen right here. Look at this amazing bathroom. Look at all this granite all over. No, 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 no. You're not buying a property for you. You're buying a rental property. You're buying an investment property. So the only deciding factor for you to take into consideration will be the numbers you should make your purchase you should make your investment all based on numbers the numbers that's what's going to talk if the numbers are not right you can almost guarantee you're going to fail in this quest why okay let's just give you an example let's say you saw this beautiful house with granite countertops and everything that you see in hgtv right and um your mortgage payment is three thousand dollars the most you can get this property out for on the market it's for a rent of two thousand dollars so that means you have to put one thousand dollars out of your pocket every single month and guess what's going to happen you could lose your job you can chance that happening right we're in the middle of the pandemic a lot of people have lost their jobs but even under regular circumstances companies are buying each other out people are downsizing and you can be one of those people who winds up without a job so imagine you are out of a job you don't even have enough money to cover your own personal expenses and now you have to worry about your rental like Let's face it, like this scenario will not look good, will not do well because it won't even give you the option to have any cash reserves because every single month you're putting money out of your pocket. And it's ironic because most people seem to fear what others will do to your property, what my tenant could do to my property, what the stranger walking in front of my house could do to my property. And they don't realize that you themselves, you yourself or they themselves are the number one enemy because they're making the wrong decision just because they decided to make a purchase with their hearts, with their eyes, and not necessarily with the numbers. And if you are interested, let's say you say, oh my God, like I like how all the risks are highlighted and there's always a mitigant to address those risks. I want to learn a little bit more. I want to learn about how I can do the market search. I want to learn about how to run the numbers so I can invest in the right property at the right time, at the right moment. Don't worry. Fear not because I've created a free webinar just for you so you can actually learn how to do all of that down here. All you got to do is just to access this link right here that you see at the bottom, sign up for it, pick a time that works best for you, and you will need at least two and a half hours to get through it. Why? Because a lot of content, useful content. So make sure you bring your notebook, your pen, so you can take notes, maybe a glass of water, maybe a cookie, because hey, for all I know, you might be signing up for the webinar after work. So make sure you have everything you need and give the webinar your full devoted attention. So here's the link, check it out. Hopefully you enjoy what I've prepared for you. And until then, I will see you next time. Take care, bye-bye.